Okay, thanks everyone for joining us for another Green College member series. Um, tonight we have Davida from the philosophy department here at UBC doing his PhD. Um, and I'll let him introduce his talk, but also I want to thank him also for jumping in kind of last minute when we had a schedule change. Um, and so, yeah, thanks again. Thank you. Um, everybody, you can, you can jo um, everyone online, you, hello? You, uh, you can uh, punch in any questions you have on the Slido, and Aisha is going to monitor the chat, and we'll ask your questions at the, at the end during the question period. Um, and then for anybody in the audience who has questions, I'll pass you the mic. Um, okay, yeah. Thank you. All right, so as you probably know, the uh, title of my talk is uh, unknown because the slides aren't, aren't working. So, okay, now they're working. Rethinking God greatness. So, um, since I assume that not all of you are familiar with philosophy of religion, I thought of starting like giving some motivation to be interested in the topic of the talk. So what we are going to do is like trying to understand better what we mean by the term God or perhaps what we should mean by this term. And um, right, so why should we bother thinking about God? I prefer just two related answers. So one idea is that whether God exists, I think it's a fundamental and interesting question. We have been asking this question for a few thousand years. And uh, so in order, to, um, um, in order to answer the question, we need to understand what we mean by the term God. And relatedly, uh, whether we are theist or atheist, I think we should know what we mean by the term in order to be responsible in having our beliefs, right? If you say, well, I think that God exists or that God doesn't exist, and you don't know what you mean by the term, then it's, it's, it's hardly going to be a rational held belief, right? So just to give you a, an example, uh, some people when they talk about God mean like something like this, but this is not what I, what I mean usually, not like, like an old man in the sky. Having said that, um, so what kind of being is God? And perfect being theology is a field or a research project in philosophy of religion that tries to answer this question. And so in what follows, I will first explain what perfect being theology is and how it works. Then I will argue that the way in which perfect being theology understands God is problematic. And finally, suggest to look at Asian religions and in particular the Pratyabhijna uh, tradition of uh, Kashmiri Shaivaism to, to, look, to find an alternative. So uh, perfect being theology. It's a research project that is usually traced back to Anselm of Aosta, uh, who lived in the 11th century. And, well, his goal was that of providing a description of God, assuming that God is the perfect being. So the idea, more precisely, is the following. You start by giving a definition of God, and there are well, slightly different but kind of similar in spirit definitions, God is that of which nothing could be greater, or God is that which nothing greater could be thought, or the metaphysically greatest possible being, something like that. And then the idea is that you infer from that the properties or attributes that God must have in order to satisfy the definition, right? So it's kind of a reverse engineering process. You know that God is the greatest possible being, and then if that's true, then there has to be certain truths about the properties that God satisfies. Uh, so what kind of properties? If we look at the definition, it's clear that the, the key term here is, is greatness, right? So philosophers, philosophers of religion talk about the properties that God is supposed to satisfy as great-making properties. And you could, in general, define a great-making property as, I mean, one way of defining it would be like, uh, like for any being X and property P, P is a great-making property is px is greater than not px, something like that, right? And so um, there is great disagreement about what are the great making properties. And uh, for example, philosophers of religion that start from a Christian perspective, they tend to argue that personhood is a great making property for reasons clearly connected to the Trinity, while 
people who come from different traditions have, well, different views about it, but in general, there is a quite a lot of agreement on this, the following three properties, which are knowledge, power, and benevolence. So most of the people agree that God is knowledge, powerful, and benevolent, to some extent. Uh, now, of course, the issue is that God is not the only being satisfying this, these properties, right? So if you take, for example, uh, I don't know, my grandma. So my grandma is knowledgeable to some extent. I mean, she knows certain things, like how to make good pasta, so she's knowledgeable. And she, she goes walking every day, you know, how to cook, to do certain things, so she has some powers, and I suppose she's benevolent to some extent, right? But of course, my grandma is not God, as you, as you could have guessed. So, <laughs> so the idea is that God doesn't simply instantiate these properties, but uh, God instantiates these properties to the greatest possible extent. God is not only knowledgeable, but omniscient, not only powerful, but omnipotent, and not only benevolent, but omnibenevolent. It is perfectly powerful, perfectly knowledgeable, perfectly benevolent. So, the debate in perfect being theology usually goes as follows. So, there are atheist philosophers who object to perfect being theology. They usually accept that accept the definition, so accept that God is the greatest possible being, and accept the implication from the definition to the properties, and then they try to show that the properties are incoherent or that you cannot possibly have them in order to show that, you, that God doesn't exist, right? So the idea is that if A implies B and B is false, then also A is false, right? That's the, 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 the reasoning behind the debate. And it usually articulates in the following way. So you have proponents of perfect being theology, and they propose what properties God must have, as I was explaining, and then there are a bunch of objections. So a common objection is uh, the incompatibility of omnipotent and omnibenevolence, because they say, well, if you are omnipotent, then you should be able to do everything, but if, if you're able to do everything, then you should be able to sin. But if you sin, then you're not omnibenevolent, right? So the two are incompatible, you can't have both. And then you have yeah, rebuttals and rebuttals, and this is how the debate goes. However, um, I want to step out of the debate in this presentation and ask if we are thinking about God and God's properties in the right way when we, when we engage in this debate, and I think that the short answer is no. And so more precisely, the claim I want to deny is that uh, God's greatness is a matter of what properties God possesses and the extent to which he possesses them. Um, I accept the definition that they give of God, but I reject that then from the definition we should infer these properties, at least in the way they, they talk about these properties. Right. So, um, consider what, what is that makes God the greatest possible being according to, uh, to perfect being theology, right? So we can compare God with a person, this is an Italian writer and philosopher, uh, Umberto Eco, and again, we evaluate with respect to certain properties, and the idea is that God is, well, greater than Umberto Eco because he has these this properties, but to a greater extent, as I was explaining. While if we compare God to a stone, and we evaluate the same properties, uh, with respect to the same properties, then the idea is that God will be greater, not simply because God has the properties to a greater extent, but because the stone doesn't instantiate the properties at all, at least, for example, knowledge, right, and benevolence. Uh, so the idea that we have in this, in this um, field of perfect being theology is that to be God is to be at the top of a hierarchy, right? So you have a hierarchy that starts with, you know, the stone, and then maybe you have plants and animals, a lot of things in between, like higher order animals, uh, I don't know, like angels and demons, if you believe that they exist, and then you have God. However, uh, I believe that this doesn't really work. And uh, the, um, the, the intuition behind my, the motivation maybe for my counter-argument is that, well, the idea is that God is not simply like as, but better. It's just something kind of 
different, right? It's a completely different level. Uh, so here's my first counter argument to, to, this, to this view. Um, so I claim that we can't make sense of commensurability simpliciter. So take, uh, take the view of the hierarchy that I was explaining, right? So according to, this, the idea is that every possible being has a position on the hierarchy and God is at the top, right? Now this means that for every couple of beings that you pick on the hierarchy, you can compare them and, and, and tell which is greater, right? Which is basically closer to the top, right? So you should be able to compare all possible beings, right? Now, let's uh, consider some comparisons. So for example, I can ask, okay, which is greater between wine and beer? And I think this is a perfectly sensible question to ask. It works. Or I could ask, which is greater between Murakami's Norwegian Wood or Umberto Eco, The Name of the Rose, which are two novels? And also, this is a sem very sensible question to ask. However, if I ask you which is greater between beer and the name of the rose, well, you can't answer. And I think that the reason is that, well, there is no common kind, uh, or, or at least it's not that easy to find a common kind subsuming both the beer and the novel, right? And you can, I mean, if you, if you uh, modify it a bit, so for example, if I ask you, is it greater, uh, well, Murakami's Norwegian Wood as a novel, or uh, Umberto Eco, the name of the rose, as a placeholder for your, for your can, then you wouldn't be able to answer because I'm attributing different kinds to the two things of the comparison, right? So this kind of shows that you need a common kind to make sense of comparisons. Now, but if that's, if that's true, uh, then to have a complete hierarchy, we need to have a kind that subsumes all beings, right? Because for every couple of beings you, you consider, there's going to be a kind subsuming them, right? So there has to be a kind that subsumes all. But that's, of course, false, um, I think, because, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, there seems to be no kind subsuming like a dog and a triangle, but they're supposed to be both on the hierarchy, right? So this, this doesn't really work, I think. Um, now, there is a way in which the perfect being theologian can answer to my objection. Uh, they can say, okay, but we don't really need a kind subsuming all beings, because we, all, we simply need all beings to be commensurable with God. So basically what, I, what they can do is uh, shifting from a um, ha, like stairs kind of model of greatness to a radial model, according to which, well, you can compare God with all possible beings, and God can win all the heads up of greatness against all possible beings, but you don't, you don't need to be able to compare all beings between themselves, right? Uh, but still, I don't see why should we assume that God is commensurable with everything. So what's, what's supposed to be the common kind between God and a triangle, or between God and an elephant, or whatever, right? So this is my first objection. By commensurable, commensurability. I mean, A and B are commensurable if they, if you can compare them meaningfully, something like that. Second objection is well, it has to do with parameters. So from kind to parameters. So comparisons are not only relative to kinds; uh, they're relative to parameters. So, for example, when I evaluate which is better between Murakami's Norwegian Wood and Umberto Eco, the name of the rose, I consider, I don't know, the quality of the plot, characters, constructions, and philosophical content, and I can assess them with respect to some parameters. And the same is when I compare God with other beings, right? The parameters here are the great making properties that we use to assess all beings on the, on the scale, basically, right? So God is more knowledgeable than everyone else, so top, and same for power, benevolence, and so on. Now, it seems uh, uh, kind of safe bet to advance the following principle. That is, for a comparison between two beings, A and B, with respect to a parameter P to make sense, uh, it has to be the case that the sense in which A is P is the same 
as the sense in which B is P. So the, if the properties applies to the two, um, to the two beings in different senses, that it's, it's not really the same thing. You can put them on the same on the same curve, so to speak, right? But I would say that if God instantiates properties at all, then the sense in which God has certain properties is arguably different from the sense in which ordinary beings have them. Uh, now, why is that the case? Um, so an argument that I didn't put in the slide, but I'm going faster than I thought, is that, well, consider uh, platonic ideas, right? So we don't really need to believe that platonic ideas exist, but let's assume that for the sake of the argument. So platonic ideas would be like perfections, right? So there is, you consider beauty, for example, there are many beautiful things in the world, and then there is the idea of the beauty, which is beauty itself, right? And all things that are beauty are beautiful because they participate, because there is some relation that, between the idea of beauty and beautiful things that makes them beautiful, right? Now, if I ask you, okay, is this painting more beautiful than that painting or the other way around, that would be a sensible question. But if I ask you whether the idea of beauty is more or less beautiful than any beautiful things in reality, I think that that wouldn't make sense, because the idea of beauty is beautiful in a different way than things which, that are beautiful in virtue of participating in the idea of beauty, right? So this is one, one reason that you can, and, and of course you can, you would suppose that the sense in which God uh, is, for example, knowledgeable is more close to the sense in which the idea of beauty is beautiful than the sense in which a painting is beautiful, right? So that, that would be a, a reason for, to believe that. Uh, another argument is the following. Um, that an important part of the idea of God is that God is supposed to be independent from everything else. That, that's actually one of the great making properties that people uh, attribute to God. They call it a CET, the property of existing per se, right? And however, consider what's the relation between an ordinary object and its properties. So you have a table, and the table has, well, a specific shape and dimension and material. And the idea is that it is in virtue of these properties that the object is a table. So it's not that there are tables that exist somewhere in reality, and then the, the properties are, like, uh, dependent on the table. It's the other way around. When a certain set of properties are instantiated here, I can say, okay, this is a desk, right? because there is this shape and this form and this, um, this height and certain properties. And the same goes for animals, for example, right? So uh, biologists give theories of uh, species, what it is to be part of a particular species, and that's uh, specified on the basis of certain properties. They can be genetic properties, morphological, phylogenetical, but in, every, in all cases, you, what it is to be something is to satisfy certain properties. Now, but if that's the case, then uh, cannot, God cannot instantiate properties in the same sense, because then God would depend on its properties in the same way in which the table depends on its properties. And so the relation must, must be different. So let me suggest a metaphorical framework to, to make sense of this, of the, of this idea. So consider this, this kind of image where you have the white light coming from one side and then decomposing in all the different colors, right? So here you can, I think this could be used as a, as a metaphorical framework. It doesn't have to be exactly literally true, but as a metaphorical framework to think what is supposed to be an idea of the relation between God and, his, and its properties that are that is compatible with uh, uh, got independence from everything else. Uh, so the idea is that God is like the white light, and then the, the various colors, they are the properties of God. So here the white is, is more fundamental than the colors, so the colors are like an abstraction from the white. Uh, and uh, the colors depend on the white, so the, I mean, if, there, if there wasn't the white light, then there wouldn't be the, all, the other, all the other different colors. But if this is the relation, then we cannot say 
that God is more powerful than a human being, because that would be like saying that a ray of white light is more red than autumn leaf, right? And that doesn't make sense, again. All right, so if, if the argument I've provided until now work, uh, then like perfect being theology is kind of in trouble, right? Because they were saying, okay, we define God in this way, and then we infer certain properties, but the, 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 the idea of God that we, that we arrive at by, by drawing these properties does, does not really work, right? So what can we do? I think that the reason, I mean, you could consider this an argument for atheism, actually, or maybe you can, you can try to look for an alternative. And I think that Asian religions uh, offer a, a good alternative model of greatness. Uh, so I could have drawn evidence from different Asian religions. Um, I think that this, you, you can find very similar views in East Asian Buddhism and certain uh, schools of Hinduism and Taoism and um, contemporary philosophers in East Asia like the Kyoto School. But here I will focus on the Pratyabhijana tradition, uh, partially because I was studying it last semester and I had to write a paper about it. So, <laughs> and, but it's also intrinsically interesting, so otherwise I wouldn't have written the paper. And uh, so the Pratyabhijana is an Indian religious philosophical tradition that developed in Kashmir uh, and that identifies God as a Shiva. And so in the paper, I consider passages from the work of two philosophers who are Somananda and Utpaladeva, and in particular Somananda Shivadristi, and I, would, I won't read the name of the work of Utpaladeva because it's complicated. Uh, Somananda is the founder of the tradition, uh, Pratyabhijana, and uh, actually the name of the, of the tradition comes from the, from the title of Utpaladeva works, right? It's Ishvara Pratyabhijana, comes, comes from there. And so they have quite a different, quite a different understanding of God. So uh, what I'm going to do now is consider with you a few passages and see what we can draw from them. So this is the very opening of the commentary that Upaladeva gives on, on, on Somananda's Shiva Dristi and starts with um, well, homage to the three-eyed Shiva, the source of the generation of all marvelous things, the one who creates the portrait of the universe on his own body, which is made of the ether of consciousness. So it's pretty cool. And uh, so what can we, what inferences can we draw from, from this passage? Well, the first idea is that this tradition is a form of pantheism or panentheism, which is the view that God is in some sense, identical with reality or the universe, or non-dual with reality of the universe. Um, and also, it is a form of metaphysical idealism, which is the view claiming that the nature of reality is mind, is consciousness, right? And we see that because, I mean, um, so the portrait of the universe on his own body would be the way in which I support the first claim, of pantheism and which is made of the other of consciousness would be the way in which I support it, the second claim. And um, well, the universe is created. So, well, in the Christian tradition, we have this idea of creation ex nihilo, right? You don't have the universe at all, and then the universe gets created by, by God who existed before the universe. Here, the idea is different. Uh, so, Somananda writes that. Uh, he, like Shiva, makes entities appear to be located outside of himself for the sake of the world of transmigration, by not perceiving his unity with those entities as a result of the power of Maya, which is basically illusion. So the idea is that, okay, so if God is reality, right, basically all what exists is, is God, right? Nothing else exists. And so all the objects in reality, like tables, chairs, trees, mountains, ourselves, they are all parts of God consciousness. And the idea is that basically uh, Shiva is playing this kind of 
role play and he is like eluding, deluding himself in order to become the limited beings that we are, right? That's, that's the view. And so the idea is that everything is God, but God makes the world appearing as variegated through this power. And one last thing that I wanted to consider in the presentation is what's exactly this relation between uh, God and, and the entities. And Sumananda has uh, a good metaphor for this, uh, which is the following. So it is like the ocean and the waves. There, the water that has become wavy is not called water, but the watery form is not destroyed there in the moment it becomes wavy. For water is only water when it is wavy or even when it is not wavy. So basically, here the idea is that the ocean is Shiva's consciousness and uh, we are all existing beings are waves in Shiva's consciousness. They're ultimately non-distinct from, from the ocean, right? I mean, if you go to the beach and look at the ocean, you don't think that there is one thing that is the ocean and then a bunch of different things separate from the ocean, which are the waves, right? They're ultimately the same thing, but from our deluded perspective, uh, we take the, the waves to be like something, something over and above the ocean. Uh, so, right, this is the idea. So basically, all beings are nothing but God, according to this view. Now, the question is whether uh, this model is compatible with the idea, with our definition, starting definition of God, that of which nothing could be greater, uh, while resisting to the objections faced by the hierarchical model, which I, which I raised before. So, regarding the first point, uh, God's greatness, well, according to this picture, basically, only God exists, or better, uh, it is existence that should be defined in terms of God. What it is for an entity to exist is to be a wave in God's consciousness. Basically, God is kind of beyond existence in this sense. And, I mean, I think this, is, this makes God, God pretty great. And uh, also, um, there is an important sense in which we can still say that God has these properties, but in a different sense. So take, take omniscient, uh, omniscience, or, no, say, om omnipotence, for example. Uh, so, if, if, again, if God is reality, then any event in reality is a result of God acting at cert a certain level of analysis. So, God is omnipotent in this sense, but it's just uh, the way in which we speak about God's power is not the same in which we speak about our powers, and so we, you cannot put... Uh, the two on a higher, the same hierarchy, right? So I think that uh, I'm willing to say that these considerations vindicate our uh, pre-theoretical idea of greatness. And uh, considering the objections that I moved, well, on this picture, God is not God in virtue of being at the top of a hierarchy. So um, basically all keeping the metaphor of, this, of the ocean and the waves, all the, all the beings that we put on the hierarchy are waves, right? And you never get to the ocean by, by listing the waves in, the, in, this, in, the, in this hierarchy. And indeed, yeah, this is what I was saying now, that hierarchy is of the type considered we rank waves like as, considered as waves, as independent of, of the ocean. And... Um, and God does not have its properties uh, in the same sense, and so it resists to the second objection, which is uh, the one that, uh, about parameters. And so, um, right, I think that the Asian traditions, and in this case, Pratibhijna in particular, offer a good way to solve the problems that the perfect being theology has. And that's all, basically. Thank you. Much faster than I thought. I hope that wasn't too fast. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, Davida. Thank you. Uh, you have a question? I can monitor the chat as well. While you... uh, so that was super fun. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, I come from a Shaivite family. Really? Yeah, so that was pretty interesting to listen to. And also, um, I, have a, I have two questions. The first one is maybe... Okay, uh, the first one is, some of this kind of reminded me of what I've read about in Spinoza's work. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've encountered it, but did it seem to you that his work was kind of saying similar things? And this idea of like, uh, you know, how widespread is this idea of like, you know, like God as like everything and everyone. That seems like an idea that in, in India, it feels like something that you typically grow mm -hmm. up with. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, when I read it in Spinoza's work in some sense, I was quite surprised. I didn't think that was as geographically widespread as all that, mm -hmm. but I'd be surprised to know where else have you, like, I'd be interested to know how, where else you've encountered, like, sort of fragments or versions of such ideas. Because mm -hmm. it feels like, yeah, it has echoes, you know, in many places around Right. The world. So, uh, well, regarding Spinoza in particular, I cannot say much because I've never read Spinoza. But yeah, usually when pantheism is, is talked about in the Western tradition, people refer to Spinoza. So he's surely a, a, the big guy in pantheism in the West. Regarding the where else I, I found this view, well, surely in, uh, in, uh, in, in Taoism, I think you can find it. So in Taoism, you have this idea, of, or at least in Taoism, how is it? How is, how is, it is interpreted by later philosophers. So there is Wang Bi, this uh, later philosopher, in, he interprets Lao Tzu's work, which is the, yeah, the start of, of Taoism, right? And, well, Lao Tzu has this idea of nothingness. Mm -hmm. and, but then, well, Wang Bi kind of explains and say, yeah, but by, by nothingness, it doesn't mean like mere nothingness. It's not just the absence of everything. Nothingness is simply the, like this impossibility of characterizing it with um, ordinary attributes, and it's actually something widespread. It's something that is everywhere, so you cannot say, uh, you cannot make distinctions that you make in your ordinary, ordinary speech. But it's, and, 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 and he actually uh, uh, say, uh, says that this nothingness is identical to um, essence. So this, again, seems the, kind of the same idea. Then you have different emphasis in different schools so sometimes it's equated to consciousness. Sometimes they just say that it's being. It doesn't have to be consciousness. But uh, so yeah, surely it's widespread. I think in East Asia and in uh, yeah Indian Indian thought. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, my second question is about one of your very early slides. I just want to make sure I get the the yeah uh, which one? It's like almost one of the first ones. I think uh, that one maybe. Uh, the, the one after that. This one? Yeah, I was okay. curious to know what you meant, what you mean when you say, like the purpose of this exercise has been, you suggest over here that we should know what we're believing and disbelieving in order to be rational um, mm -hmm. or epistemically responsible. Right. That term epistemically responsible is like, I, I would love to know what you're thinking when you kind of speak, it, speak about it that way. Right, so... So when we talk, so epistemology is the study of knowledge, mm -hmm. and when we talk about, uh, well, uh, when we use the term epistemic, we're saying that it has to do with knowledge. Right. So to be epistemically responsible, I would say, is to, is to pursue the, the, the enterprise of looking for knowledge in a careful way by looking at arguments, evidence, and... And in order to do that, you have to know what, you, what, what you're talking about. You have to know what you mean by your terms, because otherwise it's, it's impossible to, to evaluate the evidence, right? I mean, if you, if you, if you do research in, 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 I know, in physics, you have an hypothesis, and the hypothesis contains, the hypothesis, there are atoms, right? And you don't, want, you don't know what you mean by atoms. There is, it's hard to test the hypothesis, right? How, how can you test the hypothesis without knowing what you're meaning, right? So sure, yeah. yeah. That would be my idea. So, uh, um, yeah, that was interesting. So maybe you could speak a little bit to why you draw a parallel between, like, what do you mean by rational and why do you draw that as a parallel to being epistemically responsible? Right, I didn't thought too much about that. Uh, but I suppose that being rational... Uh, 
Like, what would be an I, example of being... Like, what do you mean exactly when you're saying rational? Like, I'm just curious. Like, I just right, want to make so sure I understand. Yeah. Irrational, it's difficult to define. I suppose that by rationality, I mean something like uh, being uh, careful thinkers, uh, being open to being disproven, and, I mean, use the tool of rationality. You use logic, you use um, uh, probability thinking, you use... You evaluate arguments, evidence, again, um, um, I know, I, I'm just using a pretty intuitive, pre-theoretical understanding of rationality, according to which it's just being, uh, uh, like, articulating your thoughts and idea in a careful, careful way, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I just think, so the only reason I brought this up is, like, to me, you know, like, in, and, and this is just my experience alone, I guess. It seems as though religion's one of those things that people could perhaps not be rational about in the way that we right. tend to yeah. think about yeah. being okay. rational, yeah. but still find a way to be epistemically responsible, yeah. Yeah. even if it's not consistent. Right. I think that's a, that's a good point. So, um... like I, for for you, uh, another question is. Why is this a worthwhile exercise? Why is it worth thinking about it in this manner? Is there a story there? Like, did you, did you find that you learned about it in a certain way that was appealing, and that's mm -hmm. why you like to think about religion in this manner? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that there could be a difference maybe between the logic of believing and the logic of coming to believe things. So perhaps... I believe, I mean, let's talk about not necessarily religion, something in general, right? So perhaps I believe that, I don't know, capitalism is right, or that communism is, co communism is, the, is the right economical system to implement just because my family believed that, and I, and I believe that too, right? And so the reason I believe it is it's just, just influence. It just, I, I find it intuitive. But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't be able to provide arguments to, to, to defend my view and to, to make it reasonable to other people, I suppose. So uh, in the case of religion, so there, are, there, there is this whole tradition which starts from uh, Calvin, I think, in, uh, in Western philosophy of religion, of the so-called sensus divinitatus. So that would be the idea that we have a special faculty that God implemented in us, uh, that makes us just knowing that God exists. Just you just know it, and that's and that's maybe fine, but uh, that um, that doesn't mean that you should be dispensed from being able to provide arguments and and defend your view. I suppose. Yeah, uh, I'm going to let other people ask questions, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. I love. I really enjoyed your presentation. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the mic, too. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate Aisha bringing up is the fact that, I mean, you, I think it's important to make room for more than just uh, rationality as it's usually defined mm -hmm. in uh, conversations between Western people. Because um, uh, one of the slippery things that's going on under the surface here is the question of quality and what is good. And um, goodness obviously has something to do with greatness. Um, mm -hmm. It has something to do with belief um, and with emotion and with uh, uh, perhaps upbringing and all sorts of other uh, things that are slippery and are, are difficult to pin down sometimes. And I, I want to say also thank you for uh, taking pot shots at Anselm because I've always hated his onological uh, argument for the existence of God. Okay. Um, <laughs> personally, that's just me. Um, it always reminds me of... Uh, you know, kids making tier lists for dinosaurs. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, my stegosaurus could beat your your T Rex in a fight, hands down. He's better. Um, <laughs> why? Because I say he is. Um, you know, I don't know. That's just that's just me. But um, one of the things that I was I would be interested to see you go further with. Um, I was really I was I, I was really glad when you you know turned geographical ge geographically to look at um, other ways of of thinking of things. Um, but the at least for, based on your slides, I have no basis in in uh, Indian philosophy or mm -hmm, religion. Right. Um, based on your slides, it seems that there was still very much um, 
that there were some aspects of those perspectives we saw that 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 had something in common with that dry medieval Judeo-Christian way of predominantly Christian way of looking at things in the sense that there is one there is one thing that we're thinking of as God whether it's pan or not um, there aren't others um, in the sense of equal others and that sort of thing and one of the things that I was I'm, I'm hopeful that you might uh, take more of a direction of or speak more to is uh, the notion of relationship and the idea that maybe some of how we think about God could be wrapped up in the way we relate to people around us and the way that we relate to the world and the way that uh, we imagine a connection or uh, create a connection or form attachment. Because um, that's something that I think is really important for my personal theology. Um, and it's something that I think has been missing from a lot of um, uh, theist or Christian um, philosophical arguments that I've read about from 500 years ago or 17 or 700 years ago or something like that. The idea that relationship and building bridges and connections with people is part of it. Um, so I'm curious if you have perspectives on like other you know, the thinkers you've read that, are, that move more in that direction or if you're interested in moving more in that direction yourself. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so So there is this philosopher, Japanese philosopher, he called uh, Kitaro Nishida, and he lived during the uh, Meiji period in Japan, so like the, the, in the 19th century. And um, he has this book where he's, I mean, he has a lot of books, but the book I read, <laughs> where he's uh, trying to draw together uh, views from the Buddhist tradition in East Asia, especially Zen Buddhism, but also other other schools of uh, so-called Mahayana Buddhism, which is well this long tradition, but and in Western philosophy, and uh, in doing that, he is developing a view of God which uh, resembles this very much. So a, a key point in this view is this idea of. Um, articulation, you might call it. The idea that, uh, well, before creation, let's say, you have just, to use the, the metaphor we were using before, you have just the ocean. And then the waves are like this differentiation that starts from this original kind of stillness, unity, right? And uh, so Nishida starts from this picture, and then he wants to, um, he, he's trying like to develop a whole philosophical view, right? And so he's tried to develop this ethical framework that like is in harmony with th this view and so his his idea is that the the main i mean what the main moral goal for human is like is for humans is like to go back to the to the unity right and the idea is that by building relations and especially by being compassion he talks about compassion uh, you you're exactly doing that you are reconstructing a unity uh, to some extent, and reconstructing the unity is not really is not really the idea. Um, so these traditions don't really have the idea that the that the this articulated reality is bad, right? It is bad to not realize that the creation is nothing but God, right? But living in, in this world is is pretty fine. It's absolutely fine. Actually, it's good. But you have to realize it, and then realizing it and act, acting accordingly to your realization, you 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 like bring this unity in the kind of convention, conventional world, so to speak. So yeah. that perhaps answers a bit. Another, another interesting area to look at, if, you, if for some reason you decide to, to look into that more, is um, one of the very interesting features of uh, contemporary evangelicalism, and specifically and also more broadly, um, like you know, post early 1800s, um, Northwestern or North North American Protestantism is the the major focus on God as this 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 thing that relates to you and mm -hmm. and the idea of pray praying or or worshiping God uh, as an exercise as an enacting a real relationship with the with a person who can talk to you um, and there, so there's aspects of that too which is obviously a very different I think. Um, 
uh, certainly the, the kind that I grew up with was very different mm -hmm. from what you were just talking about. Yeah. But there's, there's other avenues there too, and some, some in places that you don't expect to find it. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the intellectually stimulating talk. And as always, you know, we discuss some Buddhism stuff in yeah. <laughs> the Japanese table, so it's great to hear your, you know, um, official talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about this um, Hinduism sense of, you know, thinking about God, and uh, especially like, you know, all beings like being in like the God's consciousness or like that kind of thing. Um, that reminds me of some argument about free will. Like, for instance, if we are just beings in the consciousness, and if we are just um, go moving around and do, making actions, as you know, the God's consciousness, you know, instructs us to do then what is this what is our sense of free will what is our like um like what what is the worth of you know having a mm -hmm. discussion about free will that's really a you know considerable that mm -hmm. has you know uh got considerable attention from not just western people but from you know eastern people mm -hmm. so forth right so like how do you like not recon yeah reconcile like the argument of free will with you know this hinduism uh Hinduism's traditional view mm -hmm. of looking at a god. Um, yeah, I will ask the second question. I think it's, yeah. it's a very good question. Uh, so I was looking at an interview to a philosopher that does cross-cultural philosophy mm -hmm. yeah, uh, some, some months ago, because Jay Garfield. And he, he's very interesting because he, he knows Tibetan language, mm -hmm. and he doesn't only translate Tibetan works in English, but also English philosophers work in, into Tibetan, right? And then he was trans translating this, this work of, I don't know what philosopher, and there was the term free will. Mm -hmm. And then he realized, oh, but there is no, world, no, no word for free will in the Tibetan language. And that's kind of the same for, uh, for Sanskrit mm -hmm. and for Chinese. I, I mean, I suppose that today there is a word for free will, but I suppose not, not prior to the uh, 19th century. Um, so free will in the West is usually defined as something like the ability to choose between like A or not A, right? So you have this, you have this like twofold path in front of you, you just choose the direction. Mm -hmm. Now I think that people in these traditions would, would, would suggest that uh, this, this understanding of free will is suggesting a, a kind of dualism can, where you, you're viewing yourself a, a little bit like, like a pilot in a robot. You, you can just choose whatever you want. You, you're not really seeing yourself as fully like embodied in, in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And while in, in traditions like, like this, uh, you have a concept more, more similar to, uh, well, what in, in, in Chinese thought is Wu Wei, or in Japanese thought Mui, which is uh, basically well, one way of translating it is like no, no, no effort or no action. Like there is, it just getting in the flow, right? But it, so maybe that's not free will occur. I mean, that's surely not free will according to the Western definition. But it's not uh, that that would be the ideal according to them. So whether 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 that's applicable the the term whether the term free will is applicable to this, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, but that would be the ideal, yeah. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, yeah, cool. I just I wanted to add, uh, that was like so interesting, actually, because it just reminded me of something. I think like, you know, I mean, Shaivism is like one very, very specific sect in India, mm -hmm. um, and so much of Hinduism is very inflected with like, uh, like British era cultural values and things like that, but there are in many respects in many parts of Indian society like a quite deep determinism in a sense. Like you are, you are, you sort of view your life as 
there are certain outcomes that will happen to you, and there's a certain path that your life is likely to follow, and it's, it's reflected in how people relate to one another and how people think about the meaning of their life. And it isn't so much the absence of one's free will as much as what I grew up thinking about it maybe as, like, many parts of the game are already set. And, like, you are operating within these boundaries that are, like, quite defined. And I think that that is a cultural value that's still very deeply held among a lot of people. So, yeah, it was interesting to hear you bring that up about free will because that was something I never really thought about <laughs> in that same way growing up. And when I moved here, these, like, fundamental questions about whether or not people have free will, most of the time I thought was, why does it matter? Why is that a question that's relevant, you know? And why does it have to be envisioned in that way? It's not as if I in, saw myself as like not having agency, but rather not exactly in that sense. Like, you know, yeah, like we, like the, the constructs of society and your position and things. I mean, it can be incredibly crippling at times to think in that way, especially if you don't occupy a very like nice position in society, which is a problem a lot of Indian people have, <laughs> justly so. Um, but it is something that like, you don't tend to think about those questions in that way because you just don't even think about free will in that sense. So, yeah, it was interesting. To, I'm glad you brought that question up because it's something I've thought about for like a really long time. Can I just like, add a comment to that? Yeah, uh, yeah um, I mean, as someone who used to very firmly not believe in free will and now, now kind of depends on what side of the bed I would wake up on, <laughs> um, like the Calvinists that I've encountered that, or one, one or two of them that I remember the best that, really also had strong opinions about this and had been teaching philosophy much longer than I'd been alive. Um, I, I still remember the, the, um, the uh, perspective that they had arrived at, or the one guy especially that I remember arrived at, which was uh, uh, to, to not believe in free will, but of course to, to act as, as though you did, because if you, if you just sat in bed all day, you would <laughs> just sit in bed all day. And it, it, at some point the, the, the worrying and the questioning doesn't doesn't do you much good. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can get up and go about your day, and and that's a good thing. <laughs> so, not exactly the same. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so I I will also want I, I wanted to ask a question about this slide as well. Okay. Um, so I made this slide very quickly just because I want I wanted <laughs> to add a, a motivation at the beginning. <laughs> no, no, because. Um, you know, when I was a first year student, I took a philosophy course, and mm -hmm. one of the most hated topics was, of course, whether God exists or mm -hmm. not. But from a spiritualist point of view, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If you, like, you feel a being, if mm -hmm. you feel a being, like, spiritually or whatever, mm -hmm. like, through your senses or through your consciousness or subconsciousness or whatever, then you're happy. Mm -hmm. Right, and then for instance, in like in a lot of religions, you know, there is the thought that like you know, oh, you know, your your life will be you know secure, your next life will be secure if you do this and that and that, mm -hmm. or like yeah, even in Buddhism, right? Uh, some some sects of Buddhism, of course, mm -hmm. uh, not entirely. Then like, but in spirituality, I mean, first first of all, spirituality doesn't necessarily have a hierarchical system or anything, right? But with that said. Spirituality doesn't necessarily force believers or force like spiritualists to like ask other people around them to believe in the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Because like we, they don't necessarily have the idea of you know you you will become better if you do that. Mm -hmm. You will just sense something and then you are happy about it. Mm -hmm. Then like. Can those people just skip this question altogether? Can like, you know, like they do they necessarily have a specific motive about like why do we like we have to answer this question? Mm -hmm. We have you know we have to spread the thought. Like how do you like because this motivation is such a fundamental question to you know um, to the whole subsequent slides, which are, which are of course interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I wanted to ask this question. Right, interesting. So, um, so there. Are, I mean, there are. So a believer could 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 say that they just uh, are in a certain spiritual kind of mood, or they they feel the presence of God, 
and therefore they just believe that God exists, uh, independent of argument, independent of any argument, right? And but here uh, I want I want to em I want to emphasize that they don't they don't have to believe in God, right? They don't have to believe in this sense of God. No, right? they don't have to believe in this sense of God. Yeah, right? like some other being. Okay. Right. Let's suppose that they believe in in something, right? Now, um, in a spiritual reality, okay. Um, now, if they if they think that they have like perce perceptual evidence of it, um, I mean that's kind of evidence, right? So if I if I say that this can exist, I don't feel that I have to provide an argument for it because we see it. So I think that the believer there would be in pretty much the same position. I just I just have a perceptual evidence, so why should I provide argument, right? I, I, and I think that's fine. I mean, you could build it within an argument as I just did. You could say, I, have, I mean, perceptual evidence is a good kind of evidence. I have it, therefore, I, I believe what, what the conclusion, right? Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, James? Yeah, so just asking about your, your metaphysical picture in mm -hmm. a little more detail. So when we're talking about the relationship between God and properties, I, I think there's some clarification needed about the extent to which properties stem from God. Because if your picture is about the priority of God as sort of being the ultimate thing to which all properties are determined, right? That's the, the line analogy. Are the properties... It seems like you have two options in your metaphysical picture. Either the properties are coextensive with God, and then everything else in being a part of God, us, rocks, chairs, tables, they all have those properties in virtue of them being on the same sort of ontological status as God, right? They're up there with God. God has them. It is the, the most important or significant source of these things, and they got it. The other way of conceiving of it in, in your picture might be that you have God, God is independent of those properties, but those properties stem from God, right? God is at the top, and then you have sort of like size, you might have color, all these other secondary properties. So it seems that no matter which way you go with it, whether you turn on God being co-substantive with these properties or the properties being derivative of God but not sharing in them, it doesn't seem to me like you can make a determination of greatness based on any sense of properties then. Because if the properties right. are co-substantive with God, right, that means God isn't God, it's not great. God is co-substantive with some set of properties, some set of ideas. You're back in the platonic picture. If the properties are derivative of God, God is at the top, properties below, then we can't say that God has those properties at all, right? Thus, you can't make a claim about greatness either way, no right. matter which way the so argument turns. I think that my, that my view is more similar to the second alternative that you're listing, uh, and indeed, I mean, p part of my argument is that the sense in which you say that God is, for example, uh, instantiate uh, power is different from the sense in which other beings instantiate power. So, um, where is it? Like here, right? You have that in the case of ordinary beings, you have properties, and when a certain set of properties is uh, instantiated at the same time, you can say, okay, this is a table. In the case of God, it's the other way around. So to keep the metaphor of the ocean and the waves, the idea would be that there is a starting point, like ontological starting point, not necessarily temporal, ontological starting point where the, the ocean is still, right? And at that point, it's like if all the pro there is just one big property, it's like everyone is together, and that's, and that's identical with God, right? And then you have the waves starting to, starting to move. And... Every wave has a certain structure, has a certain way in which it manifests, and that, 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 wa that wave is the articulation of the properties from the original unity. And then you call that, that, that set of properties from the original unity a thing. Right, that, that's the picture. Yeah, so it, it seems then that your, your conclusion that you end up coming to, right, that we can sort of sensibly in a sort of quasi sense, maybe this turns on how you view language that more than anything, but we can sort of talk about greatness as being a function of God. We can, we can say that. That is a legitimate claim we can make. I'm not sure what you mean greatness is a function of God. 
Uh, okay, you're right, that was imprecise. Maybe framing it in terms of, we can sensibly say or reasonably say that there is some greatness attributed to God. And I'm saying, perhaps mm. with this picture, it's better to say that we can't say anything about the greatness of God. We just say something about the properties that stem from God yeah, as opposed suppose, to making right, right, okay, yeah. I suppose that's a that, that's a fine way, a fine way of going. It probably partially depends on your theory of language. So if you if you think that you have like a kind of referential theory of language, like you have um, like attributes, predicates, and they just refer to properties, there, there is no way to get kind of beyond beyond these properties. Then then I suppose that's that's the right conclusion to to get. But the, you you could have alternative theories of of semantics. I suppose. <laughs> So if that's the case, then doesn't the argument hinge more on a set of epistemic assumptions than ontological assumptions? Well, I mean, every, every argument that I make makes some kind of assumption in some field of philosophy. But I think that this is fine. I mean, I, I shouldn't... Uh, I, sh I, I don't think I'm assuming a particular semantic theory here. It's just... Uh, I mean, if, if you had that semantic theory, I think that that would be a perfectly fine conclusion. Still, this is a way of, of like, uh, having an alternative understanding of God, which is different from the one proposed by a perfect being theology. Perhaps you, yeah, perhaps in that case you would have to drop the definition uh, of God as that of which nothing could be greater. Uh, but also it depends because, so for example, it's not that easy for, because also actually Anselm, Anselm didn't have the view that all the contemporary philosophers of religion interpret in that way. Anselm didn't have the view that the attributes that we are attribute to God are literally properties of God. They're just ways in which we, we learn to like look at in the right direction. But actually God is kind of beyond that. So, um, so you could, I suppose, view, view this picture in, in, in that light, perhaps. Excellent. So it's nine yeah. and six. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank let's uh, thank the Vita again. Yeah. And next week, same time, same place, it's Adriana. See you there.